Chris Williamson here with you alongside two-time Super Bowl champ Brian McFadden and we're talking winners and losers of the 2024 scheduled release night and let's start off with the winners BMAC. Yeah. Who do you have as the biggest winner from this reveal? Well this is a team that is considered to have one of the more weaker schedules based on the teams they will face and of course divisional opponents and that's the Atlanta Falcons and the thing I love about Atlanta in regards to their schedule they have some very very intriguing ball games that will take place in the earlier part of the schedule when you talk about the Steelers the Eagles and the Chiefs if you're going to play those teams you would like to get them in the early part of the year. You get Pittsburgh at home. We don't know exactly what this offense will look like from Pittsburgh but with Russell Wilson as the quarterback along with a new OC in Arthur Smith. The same can be said for some new additions with Philly and then of course the Chiefs. But then you look at the rest of their schedule. I don't want to say it's a cupcake because there's no cupcakes in the National Football League. None. But in regards to winnable matchups, they have a lot of games. The rest of the way from the midway point to the ending point on their schedule, where you can see winnable ball games. If we can put their schedule back up on the graphic, you can see exactly what I'm talking about in regards to why I think Atlanta, they're one of the bigger winners when it comes to tonight's schedule release. Look at these schedules. Look at these games. You got Saints at week 10. We know one thing about Atlanta in New Orleans is always a very, very close game and usually they split. But outside of that, you have the Broncos, you have the Chargers, you have the Vikings, the Raiders, the Giants, the Commanders, the Panthers. Potentially all winnable games. And the thing I like about those matchups outside of the Chargers, Chris, yeah. they have the better quarterback. Have a better quarterback than Denver, Minnesota, whoever the quarterback will be in Minnesota, whoever the quarterback will be with the Raiders and Daniel Jones, I would take Kirk Cousins healthy. Commanders could be Jaden Daniels, we don't know. And of course, Bryce Young. So if you look at the rest of the schedule, the second half of the season, if they can just weather the storm in the first nine weeks of the season, and take care of the teams they're supposed to take care of in the second half of the season, they could be sitting rather nicely when you talk about divisional seating and, of course, playoff seating as well in the NFC. Here's the thing. Uh, right now, Vegas has the Falcons over under for wins at nine and a half. Mm. Are you taking the over there because of what you see I think later? So. I think so. Now, now, the thing about Atlanta, guys, is that we don't know. It's a lot of unknowns, question marks with this new offense, new coaching staff, new quarterback. What will this team look like? But if you just want to throw something out there, no question, look at their schedule. Tell me you don't see 10 games, winnable games, right? Just in the division alone, where you're playing against Saints, the Saints, Tampa, and the Panthers twice. Those are all what, yeah, you can win all those games. And let's say they don't sweep, they lose two. You're still sitting in a pretty good position outside of your divisional games. And then you look at the second half of the season. I mean, the Broncos, they could beat. The Chargers, they can beat. The Vikings, the Raiders, the Giants, the Commanders, the Panthers. If they just win those, th th that stretch of ball games, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven games right there. You're almost where you need to be if you take the over in regards to the win-loss record for Atlanta. So if you want, if you got that itch, it's early on, Chris. You know, there's a lot of betters that are watching us. We thank you for giving us your view, uh, your eyes. But if you got that itch right now, throw something on nine and a half over for Atlanta. I got that itch. Yeah, <laughs> I got that itch, baby. I'm ready. I'm throw ready. Something on Atlanta. Uh, what about when it comes to the biggest loser, though? Because not everybody can have a favorable schedule. Who are you looking at, man? Uh, I didn't want to do this, but I got to be unbiased when I give you guys my takes because they're honest. It's the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm. They already had considered one of the toughest schedules in the National Football League, but they're dead on with that assessment. And the reason why, Chris, is because, you know, the thing that I highlighted with Atlanta and why I love their schedule and how they finished this season with winnable matchups, it's the opposite for Pittsburgh. After week 10, look at the games they have from week 11 to week 18. The Ravens, the Browns, the Bengals, the Browns, the Eagles, the Ravens, the Chiefs, the <laughs> Bengals. Who did this? Who okayed this? They just put all of the divisional games from the weeks of week 11 to week 18. And then outside of the divisional opponents who are rather tough, by the way, they're going to sprinkle in Philadelphia and Kansas City. It's going to be they tough They have no sledding. room for error. Right. 
in regards to the first half of the season. When you talk about in the first half of the season, you still got Atlanta, you got teams like Dallas, you got some intriguing matchups, but then when you get to the second half of the season, <sighs> and, 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 and when you play those divisional games in that part of the year, that's another sign that you have no room for error. Right. You and know it, what I mean? And so it, it's, it's a tough situation yeah. to be in. And it doesn't help that they have a new quarterback, right, a new <clears throat> offensive coordinator. So it's not like this is year three for them. No, this is year one for Russell Wilson and Arthur Smith. Will they be able to cook? I don't know. But like you said. Uh, I hope they got them pots and pans hey, ready, baby. Hey, I'm with you, man. I, I think they can so. cook up something I love special. I'm hitting that spoon, hit that pan, man. It's eating time. <laughs> we love to eat here on CBS Sports HQ, uh, and we're always interested, B Mac, in your thoughts, especially your top five matchups to watch this season. Oh man, listen, there's a lot. I mean, it's hard to only pick five, but Lucas, our producer, told me, he said, B Mac, you better pick five and give me your best five. So here's my best five. Starting off week one. There's no reason to wait around. Like, we've been waiting for this ball game for such a long time. Week one is here, Ravens, Chiefs. Then you got the Texans, Bills, right? You have the Chiefs, 49ers, Eagles, Cowboys, Lions, 49ers as well. I mean, these are all star-studded games and all with playoff caliber teams. A few teams that could get to the Super Bowl in New Orleans. And I love the quarterback star power. In all, of five, in all five of these matchups, when you look at the Lions and the 49ers, that's a rematch. Yep. Star power, quarterback star power. You look at the Eagles and, and the Cowboys, you can say whatever you want to say about that Prescott. That's star power when you talk about that matchup and knowing what, is, what could be at stake with the Eagles and the Cowboys in regards to divisional matchups. And then we look at Josh Allen, C.J. Stroud. You know, I talked about the revenge element with Stephon Diggs, but both quarterbacks could be in that MVP conversation by the time uh, they kick off as well. So it's hard to really just put five. I tried my best. Please don't jump on me if I left, off, left out a matchup that you believe should be worthy. But that's my top five. It's my list. I'm sticking to it. Hey, I'm not mad at it. I know every, you can't make everybody happy. No question. But what I saw there on the screen, I'm with you on that. And BMAC is going to be here for much more content as we look ahead to some NFL trends for the schedule release. And also, check out more football content, content with the Pick 6 podcast. Host Will Brinson and a host of Dynamic Guests for your daily fix of NFL news and analysis. Coming up, as I mentioned, we're looking at some of the top scheduled trends in the NFL after we just got them all. Weeks 1 through 18. It's coming up right here on CBS Sports HQ. BMAC coming with us to give us more expert opinions. <laughs> it's all about revenge right now as we look at some of the top revenge games in the league. Falcons QB Kirk Cousins. Returning to Minnesota in week 14, Sunday at 1. Kirk's second all-time for passing TDs. Vikings history, 171, behind the great Frank Tarkenton. And for more, we welcome in CBS Sports football analyst Brian McFadden and CBS Sports NFL analyst Charles Davis. So, guys, Kirk facing his old team right later in the season, mm -hmm. not at the beginning. We know what he did for Minnesota, right, all those years. Wasn't able to get them to a Super Bowl, but... Not everybody's able to do that. So no when you look at this matchup, Charles, uh, how motivated do you think Kirk is going to be, especially coming off the way his season ended last year with that injury where he wasn't able to realize uh, his full potential maybe? Well, Chris and, and B. Mac, every player is always motivated to go against a team that he played for because usually you're not there and it feels like they don't mind you not being there. All right? And even if everything was so-called amicable, you always feel like, wow, you guys just let me walk. You let me go. But here's the thing. If this were earlier in the season, and BMAC, I don't know how you feel about it, I think it would carry more importance. I think later in the season, you are into the, the, the work of the year, what's going on at that time, and who knows where the records are going to be at that point. Might be playing for something a little bit bigger than just getting revenge on the Minnesota Vikings. And last but not least... He did make a whole lot of money while he's there. So you can only be so <laughs> mad about being gone. And I think also, too, as I stated earlier, being a competitor, anytime you get a chance to play against your former team, regardless of why you're no longer there, you want to beat them and to, 
to uh, Charles's point, week 14, there's a lot that has circulated in regards to the scheduling in the win-loss record. So for Atlanta or for Minnesota, they're trying to win this ball game because it could be a very, very important one in regards to getting into the tournament. But for Kirk Cousins, he's the ultimate professional. He won't emphasize the revenge like factor to this ball game but you better believe deep down inside it's almost like breaking up with your girlfriend and seeing her months down the line you want to make sure that new girlfriend you got looks better than your old girlfriend and you want to find a way to kind of stick it to her just a little bit that could potentially oh be my. Kirk Cousins against the Vikings. Oh my. What'd you say? What'd you oh say, my. Charlie? <laughs> oh my. Is, is Benny King about to sing or who was? No, excuse me. Percy Sledge about to sing when a man loves a woman. Go ahead and plug me, Mac. Go ahead and let it out. Hey, look, Kirk ain't going to let that be known in the public's eye. You better but believe best it. believe he's talking to his wife about, oh, yeah, I'm ready. I got that date circled. No question. Okay, honey, we're going to do what we do. Uh, speaking of nasty breakups, uh, Russell Wilson in the Steelers facing the Broncos week two right here on CBS at 425 p.m. Eastern. And that whole contract dispute, right, about Russell Wilson and when they were in that losing streak and then they went on a win streak, Sean Payton, management. Um, there's going to be bad blood. I know Russell is a guy, Charles, who preaches positivity. He's all mm -hmm. about God, but he's still human at the end of the day. So what are you looking to see from Mr. Unlimited against his old team and Sean Payton? Well, look, he, he left Seattle feeling like they didn't want him right and and he was ready to be gone from seattle almost felt somewhat mutual by the time it all went down but the denver one's a little bit different he came in there you know riding the the the, the white bronco and not the one oj went in i'm talking about the horse okay and he was talking about let's ride and everyone welcomed him with open arms and they were thinking grandeur and boy did that go south the first year and then here comes sean payton who let him know right away you're not all that i am I'm the guy in charge of this thing, and, and you better figure it out. And now he's gone 0 for 2. I just think he's hit the right place, B Mac. I think he's hit the right spot with Mike Tomlin and the Steelers' style of play. Pittsburgh got back to it at the end of last year with Najee Harris running the ball, and he's going to be running for a big contract, whether it's with the Steelers or someone else. Jalen Warren, they added to the offensive line. You remember how he played in Seattle with that big running game, throw over the top? I think this is it, and he realizes. Last chance to be Russell Wilson one more time, but I think he's hit the right spot for it. And yes, he will be motivated. Yeah, and this is a different scenario than the one we just laid out for our viewers with Kirk Cousins, because Kirk goes back to Minnesota week 14. Russell is playing against his former team week two. And Charles, you talked about the timing of this opportunity is different. When it's earlier in the season, it means more. It's still fresh. The body is still warm when it <laughs> happens earlier in the year. And one thing I know about Mike Tomlin, Atlanta is the first opponent for the Pittsburgh Steelers. If Pittsburgh get, get, gets off to a good start, they win that ball game. They're 1-0. Oh. Week 2 is super important because you want to be 2-0. and oh. But hypothetically speaking, and I hope this doesn't happen, what happens if they don't take care of their business first week against Atlanta. It makes this Denver Bronco game that much more important because you don't want to start off 0-2. And, and this is another motivational factor in regards to keeping things afloat if you're undefeated going into Denver or if you're winless going into Denver, Denver. And not to mention, rallying around your guy in Russell Wilson. And I know Mike Tomlin, when you talk about having that first meeting on Monday, Charles, he's going to highlight the, 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 the past ball game, but get ready a little bit for that early in-game uh, 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 planning for Denver. And he's going to highlight our quarterback used to play for this guy. Don't let your quarterback down. Mm -hmm. Find a way to support him so we go into Denver, take care of our business, and come out. Most importantly, Russell Wilson is smiling. Because if they win, Russell will be smiling. Oh, yeah, he's going to let off some uh, cryptic <laughs> tweet, right, uh, about the Broncos and Sean Payton. Uh, first time these two teams have faced each other since 2021. So the NFL scriptwriters doing their thing. How about Saquon Barkley returning to MetLife Stadium against the Giants in Week 7? Fourth most rushing yards, y'all, in Giants history. And it's crazy to see the shift of the Giants fan base, how they cannot stand Saquon being on the Eagles. And I get it to a certain degree, but the act of this, he did something terrible to him uh, or terrible to them. Uh, but on the field, Charles, what do you think Saquon is going to bring when he's in his former team's house and he could have maybe a Christian McCaffrey-like transition 
as he did with the Panthers to the 49ers. Chris, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's a, a great starting point. And let's go back now two seasons ago when Philadelphia was riding roughshod all the way to the Super Bowl. How did they do it? They ran the heck out of the football. Miles Sanders was, was a monster that year running the ball. Not so much in Carolina without that big offensive line and that emphasis on running it. And it just feels like even though Nick Sirianni obviously has given up play calling, he did that a few years ago, but his influence on the team, he's old school about wanting to build with the offensive line, run the football, the whole deal. Remember, he's a product of a very successful high school football coach in Western New York, and he and his brothers have adopted many of the same methods. And here comes Kellen Moore. And remember why, hey, BMAC, why did Mike McCarthy say the Kellen Moore move was made? He didn't well, we want to run the ball. Football more. We didn't run it enough. <laughs> Kellen Moore, I think, is going to let people know this year. He doesn't mind running the football when he has the personnel. And Saquon Barkley gets that opportunity. If things are going the way I expect them to go, wouldn't surprise me if Saquon Barkley sets a season high in carries in that game and then adds another five or six out of the backfield catching it. I mean, it's safe to say Saquon Bar Barkley is the most talented running back in the National Football League, not named Christian McCaffrey, when it comes to his skill set and his ability. And that's why I like this new relationship with Saquon in Philadelphia, because strategically speaking, as Charles laid out for us, Philadelphia has done a phenomenal job in running the football. Not so much a year ago right. because of injuries, but when they've been healthy, they found ways to run the football with players that are not as talented as Saquon Barkley. So you put Saquon Barkley in the backfield along with Jalen Hurts, who can occasionally become a plus one in the running game, good luck in slowing them down. In regards to this matchup, when Saquon travels back to MetLife, he is going to be booed so much. <laughs> Just get ready, Saquon. I would advise Saquon, don't bring your family to the game. Your significant <laughs> other, your children, leave them, let them be. Leave them in Philadelphia because anyone attached or tied to Saquon Barkley is going to hear it because to your point, they feel some type of way, not solely because Saquon is no longer a part of the New York Giants organization because it was more about the Giants not wanting him yep, there yep. than anything, but all about Saquon leaving the Giants and going to Philadelphia. Not hey, personally. Chris, let me jump in real quick oh, yeah. on that. BMAC, I know you. We all know you. We watched you play. Did you ever play better than when everyone was against you? No question. Yes. That's why That's why I think I'm going to find it very interesting when he hits MetLife. And the Giants fans can go after him all they want. Saquon is a nice person, but he is tired of losing. He's tired of making the carries and not getting what he wants. This is his opportunity, and Philadelphia has a chance to change things. I can't wait to see Cam Jurgens handle center because it's going to be different than Jason Kelsey yep. being there, especially for the quarterback in the quarterback run game. But for everything else, the pieces are in place. Saquon Barkley can't wait to get back to MetLife and absorb those boos. <laughs> and oh, yeah. And not only is he tired of losing, his child is tired of losing. No because when he made that change, it was like, Daddy, uh, does this mean we're going to stop we're losing? Gonna, we're going to stop losing. Are we going to start winning again? Yeah. So, you, yeah, it, the storylines are out there. I can't wait for the atmosphere. And one great atmosphere is going to be the Harbaugh Bowl, right? Week 12, <laughs> last time Jim and John coached against each other was in the Super Bowl. John's Ravens outlasted the 49ers in Super Bowl 57, or 50, excuse me, Super Bowl 47. So, Charles, when you look at the uniqueness of this coaching competition uh, what really stands out to you and how fun is it going to be to see them battle against each other with the X's and O's again well two things jump out at me Chris and the first one was you mentioned it was the Super Bowl also known as the night the lights went out in New Orleans which is actually hosting the Super Bowl again this year so wouldn't that be something if this turned out to be a preview of an AFC championship game for the right to go to the Super Bowl because now they're in the same conference. But here's the here's the thing that I come back to. Jim Harbaugh team is coming back with a national championship at Michigan. But I would dare say that if somehow they had not won it last year, he was still headed back to the NFL because Jim Harbaugh's ultimate prize is a Lombardi trophy and his brother has one and he does not. Is he happy with having an NCAA championship? Sure, that's great. And even, you know, we know it's not truly NCAA, but you know that you get the idea, the national championship, great. 
But the Lombardi Trophy, the ultimate reward for a competitor like Jim Harbaugh, that's why he's back in the NFL. That's what he wants to add to the trophy case. I think Dad might have to be there again. Dad Harbaugh might have to be there to referee this one because they may smile and grin, B Mac. <laughs> but this one's all about that trophy and winning. And Jim's tired of losing to Bro. And, and real quick, with that being said, it's safe to say during this Thanksgiving affair, Jim will be sitting at the little kid's table. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Why, bro, sit at the big table because he has that sticky Lombardi. Right. Back, he won't even be at the table. He'll be in his RV outside the house. <laughs> No hey, he question. was at the table for a second because he got that national title. But, of course, yeah, he's still looking. Yeah, that national that title won't get you the big table. Mom, can you bring my turkey outside to the RV? <laughs> I'm not sitting with that guy right now. <laughs> I love the sibling rivalry. Uh, but, you know, Charles, there are so many interesting revenge games. Is there one game that really is at the top of your list for 2024? And with this schedule, how can we keep it to one? But I'll be quick. Rams at Lions right out of the gate. Goff and Stafford, tra trading team. Stafford got the ultimate prize. Goff just got the bag. So guess what? Goff trying to get back to the Super Bowl and win it. He has a team that's capable of doing it. And don't forget, later in the season, Lions at San Francisco, NFC Championship game rematch. I dare say that if the Lions run it successfully in the first half in this one, they'll keep running it this time you in the second so. half. I would hope so. I do, I do think that might change a little bit, B-Mac. Yeah, no question for me, Charles. I'll go to the AFC, and I have one for you. Buffalo traveling down to H-Town, Houston. Stephon yeah. Diggs' revenge game. Stephon Diggs had a lot of on-the-field production with Josh Allen, but for some reason became a bit disgruntled, wanted to find a way to get out. They gave him his request. Now he's down in H-Town. What will Stephon Diggs have in store against his former team along with his new quarterback in C.J. Stroud. I can't wait to see that kicks off. Hey, man, Stephon. Remember his, remember his production? Minnesota early, tremendous. Yep. Buffalo early, tremendous. If the pattern holds true, monster year ahead of him in, in, in Houston. Facts. And Nico Collins may not get as many yards, but Houston may have more success. Right, and that's what it's all about at the end of the day, trying to get a Lombardi trophy with that franchise. And look, I could talk to y'all all night long, but we got to take a short break. And on the other side of it, we're talking about some trends that we've noticed for this 2024 schedule release. It's all coming up right here on CBS Sports HQ, baby. Welcome to our NFL schedule release show on CBS Sports HQ. I'm Chris Williamson, and he is the two-time Super Bowl champ, Brian McFadden, CBS Sports football analyst. And, Brian, when we look at revenge games yep. in the NFL, I know sometimes y'all talk to the media and you're like, we don't care, just another game. <laughs> but uh, take us behind the curtains, right, in the locker room. How do you players that you play with and yourself feel about revenge games when it's all said and done? Well, Chris, first and foremost, anytime a player says we don't look at this as a revenge opportunity, it's a lie. It's a lie. The competitor in you won't allow that to be the case. You might say that publicly just to kind of keep things, everything even kill. But when you know what's at stake and trying to get an opportunity to get some get back, who doesn't want some get back when you talk about sports and competing? So I love when you look at the, ske the schedule and the makeup of the schedule, we see a lot of rematches from a year ago where a team potentially can have a revenge type mindset in trying to avenge a loss that happened the year before. Yeah, and so speaking of avenging losses, uh, the Ravens want to avenge that loss they took against Kansas City in their building, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think about this matchup? Because Kansas City, of course, they return Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, Chris Jones. For the Ravens, they added Derrick Henry, which is hopefully they're going to run the, the damn ball this time. <laughs> uh, how do you see that matchup unfolding, knowing that the Ravens were so close despite playing not great ball on offense. Well, I see this matchup being headlined with the quarterback play. If you go back to the AFC Championship game, Chris, it was Pat Mahomes who made the extra plays that needed to be made for them to advance. We didn't see that from Lamar Jackson. You talked about running the football. Strategically speaking, we saw a strategy that really didn't fit what Baltimore did to get to that point. So 
put all of that into the pot and let's see exactly which chef can prepare the best dish. So far, when you look at these matchups, especially in the regular season between Andy Reid, Coach Harbaugh, the Ravens, and the Chiefs, the Chiefs have had the Ravens number. Pat Mahomes have had the Ravens numbers. Can Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens find a way to get around this MJ type right. image of Pat Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs to be able to show the entire NFL world like, yo, this is the regular season, but we're just giving you guys a little indicator on what could potentially happen if we see you guys again in the playoffs. Well, Vegas expects this game to be a close one because the Chiefs right now, two and a half point favorites. You taking the Ravens there to cover? No, no, nope, no, no. Nope. I'm taking Kansas City. I, oh, oh, okay. I'm, not, I'm not going against Pat <laughs> Mahomes until I see otherwise. Pat Mahomes in Kansas City, you talk about the month of September. I mean, you can't name another team that has been hotter than Kansas City with Andy Reid and Pat Mahomes. You can't name another quarterback that has been hotter in the month of September than Pat Mahomes. So until I see otherwise, and oh, by the way, the last time I checked, they will have Travis Kelsey. Yep. They will have Chris Jones along with that Arrowhead fans, that the fans there in Arrowhead. I love Kansas City in this spot early, an early lean with Kansas City. Okay, I'm not surprised by that whatsoever because a lot of people doubted Kansas City in that yep. AFC title game, and uh, they were proven wrong. Uh, week two. NFL God sends us another mouthwatering matchup, right? <laughs> Bengals against Kansas City. If Joe Burrow is fully healthy, I know we talked about in the preview, um, do you think the Bengals are going to be able to take down Kansas City once again? Because they've given Patrick Mahomes some trouble no in the past. Yeah, this is a different scenario than what I laid out when you talk about Baltimore playing against Kansas City in the regular season. Joe Burrow, they're not afraid of Pat Mahomes. They're not afraid of the Kansas City Chiefs. They've had a lot of success. Even in postseason play as well, they've had a lot of success against Kansas City. So this is a team right here, when you look at Cincinnati, they will go as far as Joe Burrow takes them. That's the concern. That's the question mark. Can Joe Burrow stay healthy? Week two, we assume. I hope so. He will be healthy <laughs> week two, right? And that's not the issue. It's about midway, the latter part of the season. Can he stay healthy? But when you look at this opportunity, you know how I talked about the revenge factor kind of for Baltimore and Kansas City? One would say Kansas City could have a revenge type factor when it comes to Cincinnati because as you guys saw in the graphic, Kansas City, they haven't fared well when they play against a healthy Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, uh, the Bengals definitely uh, have their number in the regular season, but Kansas City, they have uh, two Super Bowls, right, no in the question. past two years, so they take that all day, night, and long. Now, speaking of revenge, uh, the 49ers, I know they're coming for blood, right? Week 7, <laughs> Super Bowl 58 rematch. It's going to be at Levi Stadium. You know Brock Purdy, Kyle Shanahan, they're trying to cook up something special to finally take them down. When you look at this matchup, the different changes that have happened in the offseason, um, do you feel like the 49ers are primed to beat Kansas City, or are we going to see Andy Reid and this offense outclass the 49ers once again, man. I mean, my thing is this. This is week seven. So yeah. you talk about that point in the season. Both teams should be, you know, well inclined to who they are when it comes to the football identity. The luxury San Francisco has, Chris, at their disposal is they're playing at home in the Bay Area. E-40, the rest of the fans going to be there. They're going to be fired up. And that's a revenge opportunity for San Francisco. But this is more about the coaching battle. Andy Reid, Kyle Shanahan. Andy Reid has dominated Kyle Shanahan, right? Andy Reid has dominated a lot of coaches. But for Kyle Shanahan, you got to find a way to get through this Andy Reid gauntlet. Because when you talk about Kansas City and San Francisco, one would say in talent when it comes to the personnel, you would take San Francisco as having a better team on paper. But the end result hasn't, hasn't backed that point. So for San Francisco, yes, this is, isn't the postseason, but it is an opportunity to showcase if we were to meet again, this is what you're going to get. Because the last two times these two teams have faced off in a Super Bowl-like opportunity, San Francisco they didn't find a way to finish the drill. And also to remember, Chris, in those Super Bowl opportunities with Kansas City and San Francisco, San Francisco had double-digit leads right. both in both ball games. And that's why I factor in the coaching battle. Because Kyle Shanahan... Whatever the case was, took his foot off the gas. The strategy that we saw in the first half didn't translate to second half football, second half production. So can he find a way to finish the drill? Because they haven't been able to finish the drill, and you can put a lot of that on the quarterback, you can put a lot of that on the players. But at the end of the day, it's about the captain, the guy who's 
maneuvering the ship, and that's the head coach and Kyle Shanahan. Yeah, it definitely didn't help with the perception, right? Uh, the overtime rules, people were saying, yeah, I didn't know the overtime <laughs> rules. And that, that, it doesn't matter. You say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Oh, he, yeah, I feel like if he, if, if he didn't know it, understand the overtime rules, you know one thing you got to do. Stop them from scoring and you got to score. That's it. It's simple. <laughs> simple mathematics. Now, the Jets, they opened the season on Monday Night Football for the second straight year with Aaron Rodgers under center against San Francisco. We know he's been salty yep. about them passing on him, and we understand that he's coming back from that Achilles injury. This is a pivotal year. Oh. For the Jets. There is so much pressure, not just on him, but the coaching staff. What are you expecting out of the Jets in this game? I'll say this before I talk about my expectations, and I would love to hear our producer, who's a big-time Jets fan, Lucas, what he would say to this. I think the Jets, they have the most pressure almost out of any team in the National Football League especially in the AFC. And the reason why I say that is because this is a team that has been, they've been wanting, fiending for some type of success, fiending for a taste at postseason play. It got haltered because of the injury to Aaron Rodgers. So you kind of got a pass. You got an excuse. Robert Salah and his staff, they got an excuse. This year, no excuses. And this is the first opportunity, week one, to showcase what we can do with a healthy Aaron Rodgers. So there's no more excuses left to be thrown out to all of the football world, right? It's about finding a way to get the job done. Because if you don't get the job done this year, if Aaron Rodgers is healthy and you still don't get the job done, it's safe to say it will be, I don't want to say cleaning of the house, but it will be some new movement happening there with the Jets based on the expectations and just the wanting to find a way to be relevant and competitive. So San Francisco is a team that has lofty expectations, high expectations. The same can be said for the New York Jets, knowing that Aaron Rodgers is finally healthy. Uh, they have seven primetime games. Exactly. Right? Seven yes. primetime games yes. based on what they did last year. You and don't remember, just... they had a lot of primetime games as well, and we was forced to watch them on a primetime stage without Aaron Rodgers. That would... That was not fun, right? <laughs> that was not fun whatsoever. But when you look at the game specifically, BMAC, uh, how scared should the Jets be of that defensive line for the 49? I know the Jets made some changes mm -hmm. at offensive line. You bring in Morgan Moses over from the Ravens. What are you Tyron looking at? Smith. Yep. What are you uh, looking at that matchup? That's the thing. The Jets, it's, it feels like it's been a decade or so the Jets have been trying to rectify their offensive line. They've been drafting guys. They've been trying to develop guys. It hasn't worked out. The injury bug has played a big factor in the inability to be relevant on the offensive line or just missing on guys, right? And when you factor in bringing Moses, bringing in, 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 in Tyron Smith, two established veteran guys who are clo closer to the end of their career than the beginning, can they give you the play that you need to have? Especially, as you mentioned, against San Francisco, where the foundation of their defense is starts with the guys who put their hand in the dirt and dig those cliques into the grass, led by Bosa. And also, too, can't forget about Leonard Floyd, right. who was a part of that Jets-Bills matchup that led to Aaron Rodgers getting injured the first week of the season back in 2023. So this is, the, the, this is a great litmus test for the Jets because you're going to see exactly what your offensive line is made of week one. Because if they can't protect against San Francisco, granted San Francisco, I believe, will have one of the best defensive line units in the National Football League, it's going to be a long, long season for Aaron Rodgers if he can't stand upright to be able to do what he's been called to do, which is deliver passes. Right, because not only can he deliver passes, but we've seen him use his wheels as well. But at this point in his career, yeah. I don't think that's going to be his calling card. You definitely have to make sure he's protected. But the NFL... BMAC uh, has always been a global brand. Yes, sir. And they are going out to so many countries. Packers and Eagles, week one in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. I heard South me and you going, Chris. You're hey, right. what? Yes. I, I didn't know that. I just told oh, you. okay. Surprise. Hey, look. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. That would be one hell of a trip, right? First time the NFL is playing in South America. And then Jets and Vikings in England. How about the Jaguars? Twice in a row. Yeah. They're going to be in London, and then of course in Germany, Giants taking on the Panthers. What game really stands out to you here? I'll say week one. It's not just about the Packers and the Eagles. Oh, by the way, I do believe that's going to be a nice matchup, but it's in Brazil. It's in Brazil. That's uncharted waters when you factor in the American game, which is football. Brazil is more about football, soccer. So Ronaldo, how yep. will the fans receive 
our game. Clearly, they're prepared because I highly doubt Roger Goodell and his team would agree to have a game in a place where it's not going to be well received. When you look at what we've done in, 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 in Europe, uh, Germany, you know, cross broad, even in Mexico, we know it's going to be well received. Brazil is a place we've never been before. When you talk about having a NFL game there, as as th th that I can think of, but that's the game that I'm looking forward to because it's like it's uncharted territory for us when it comes to our sport and knowing what their sport has been, which is football, soccer. Yeah. Hey, look, man, that atmosphere I know is going to be crazy. Maybe mm -hmm. they'll uh, bring out the Vuvuzelas, right? Nationwide, you know, it's going to be box office for sure. And then coming up, though, uh, we're going to have. A preview, or not a preview, I should say, but we're going to look ahead to the week one matchups that Can't are going wait. to be released. And BMAC is going to give his thoughts on that. So much more to get into right here on CBS Sports HQ NFL release schedule preview show. We're back here on CBS Sports HQ, and here we have it the week one schedule. For 2024, Green Bay against the Eagles. How about the Cardinals? Marvin Harrison Jr. against the Bills. Patriots, Bengals. How about the Rams against the Lions? Right? Matthew Stafford, Jared Goff. The Commanders, Jaden Daniels, their top pick. Going up against Baker Mayfield and the Buccaneers. Cowboys, Browns. That should be entertaining. Then Denver against the Seattle Seahawks, Vikings, Giants, you got the Jags against the Dolphins, then VMAX Steelers mm. taking on the Falcons, who there are a lot of questions there about what they're doing at QB with Kirk Cousins and then also Michael Penix Jr. All right, back here with Brian McFadden, two-time Super Bowl champ. And you just saw the yeah. week one schedule. Uh, what excites you the most right now? Oh, man, it's a lot, Chris. It's a lot to unpack. You know, we talked about Baltimore, Kansas City a lot already. You know, highlighted the Jets, San Francisco. Um, briefly talked about Green Bay and Philadelphia. But when you talk about those matchups, those are marquee matchups, playoff caliber teams. You know what I mean? When you talk about the expectations and the success they had a year ago, and along with some of the added personnel. So for me, when you look at other games that we haven't really highlighted yet, I got to go with, I got to go down to, to the Dirty South, Atlanta, right? Uh, Pittsburgh and, and Atlanta, the Falcons. And the reason why I'm highlighting that matchup, clearly, of course, I played with Pittsburgh. But then what will this Steelers offense look like with Russell Wilson as, at the quarterback position? Or will it be Justin Fields? Regardless, it's going to be a new quarterback from what we saw in 2023 for the Pittsburgh Steelers, right? Under Arthur Smith as the new OC who was the head coach for the Atlanta Falcons a year ago. And then when you transition to Atlanta, let's keep it real. Since the draft, they've been one of the more talked about teams in the National Football League that did not make the playoffs a year ago. Didn't come close to making the playoffs. So Kirk Cousins in this new look regime offensively for Atlanta, how will they look? Will they showcase the ability to be a relevant team in the NFC? Or will they still have some concerns? Because some people feel like the NFC with Atlanta in the NFC South could be a dark horse team to make it out of the division based on how watered down the division potentially could be when you look at what happened or did not happen a year ago in the NFC South. So that's another matchup. And then if you want to transition to another prime time game on a night, in a, in a night opportunity, you have the Rams traveling to Detroit. Uh, two teams we saw face off last year. Two teams that have big time tides. When you talk about Brad Holmes, who was once with the Rams, when you talk about the two quarterbacks who played for both teams, yep. both teams in past, past opportunities. So, and I love Detroit. I think Detroit has an opportunity to compete with the cream of the crop in the NFC. And Sean McVay, I think Sean McVay is one of the best coaches in the National Football League. The job he did last yep. year yep. was second best to what he did when the year they won the Super Bowl. That, that that's to me, is how impressive the job he did last year, getting into the playoffs with a lot of unknown players.
players that became household names because of their development and his ability to put them in good situations. Especially Puka Nakua. Yes. Nobody expected. Kyron that, Williams. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just the list go on. The names go on and on. Uh, just underscores, yeah, how great of a coach Sean McVay is. But if there's one matchup, B Mac, you had to circle as your favorite. Which one would it be? And oh, wait, hold up. We got Bears. Yeah, we got the Bears. Caleb Williams yeah. against Will Levis. Will Levis. Yeah, that's me. I, yeah. I, mean, I mean, if you're a Chicago Bears fan, yeah. that's the matchup you want at home against Tennessee. We need to get Joe Moose on here. Yeah, yeah I, I think Joe would second that. So, yeah, give me Tennessee. Even though Tennessee has improved dramatically, but that's the matchup you want. You know, another team, another matchup that I like as I look there, let's go all the way down to South Florida. Jacksonville traveling to Miami to play against the Miami Dolphins. Jacksonville, in my opinion, Chris, was one of the more disappointing teams in the National Football League compared to what they did under year one under Doug Peterson and then bounce back to not bouncing at all in his in his second year as the head coach. Can they bounce back? Can Trevor Lawrence look like the next great quarterback? What about Tua Tunga Vailoa? Two quarterbacks that are fighting to potentially have a new contract. Will Tua Tunga Vailoa have a tr contract in place by the time this game kicks off? We don't know. But both teams believe they have their guy at the quarterback position to lead their franchise moving forward. So that's another intriguing matchup as well when you talk about week one matchups. That's a one o'clock game uh, in the one o'clock slate of ball games. So I, I, I like that because of the parity between both organizations and the connection when you look at the quarterback. Right, the expectation for both said quarterbacks. Yeah, and they're very polarizing QBs. You know, some people think they're great. Other people think that, you know, the Dolphins and the Jaguars should eventually move on from Trevor Lawrence and Tua Tungavailoa. But we'll see how it all shakes out this year. How about the Browns, mm. man? They have the toughest schedule, right, according to the opponent's last year's winning percentage. Uh, we know what happened last season, right, where the Browns had all these injuries. They bring Joe Flacco off. The street from his home, taking care of his kids, and they get him into the playoffs. This time, they have Deshaun Watson back. Hopefully, Mr. Chubb is going to be at his optimal form. How do you think they're going to fare this season? Do they get to 11 wins? You know what, Chris? I think so. I think this is a talented team. But they were successful without their franchise quarterback in Deshaun Watson. So that puts a lot of pressure on Deshaun Watson. Because this is a team a year ago that showed all of us they could win without you. Based on their defense yep. being unbelievable and finding the ways to get serviceable guys at the quarterback position. Now look at their schedule. Let's keep their schedule up real quick for me. When you look at the first five ball games, if you're a Cleveland, if you can find a way to take care of your business at home, against Dallas and Jacksonville, you can go into week six undefeated. Now, I understand there's a lot that could happen between now and week six, but when you look at what the teams did a year ago outside of Dallas and even Jacksonville, I mean, Giants didn't do a lot last year. The Raiders, we know about the commanders and their issues. They have a new quarterback. I mean, this is a great opportunity for Cleveland to get to an early, jump out early when it comes to winning ball games because week one, you got Dallas, a worthy opponent, playoff caliber opponent, but they will, they will be favored in that ball game. I think it's safe to say in the first five ball games of the season, I haven't seen the lines for all, the, all of those games, but my assumption would say Cleveland would be the favorites in all of those ball, all of those ball games against those opponents, even at home against the Dallas Cowboys. So for Cleveland, I mean, the, this is a schedule, even though it's the toughest schedule, as you laid out for us, Chris, but they don't start in the midst of the toughness. Right. Yeah. Right? So you get an opportunity. If you take care of the, your business like you're supposed to, when you get in the midst of that gauntlet, you have room for error because you took care of your business early on. So when you look at those ball games against, you know, the Cowboys and Jacksonville and Washington and the Raiders and the Commanders, and then you get Philly, yep. I mean, that's a prime opportunity. That's the, that's the best way you would like to start your season, knowing that you have one of the toughest schedules of the National Football League. Yeah, uh, the Browns, uh, one and a half point underdogs against the Cowboys. Wow, and, yeah. I was wrong. Yeah, one and a half point underdogs what? against the Cowboys. So. Take Cleveland. All right, okay. we're going to see it. <laughs> Nick Chubb, baby. Let's get it going. That defense, Miles Garrett. Uh, you know who doesn't have a tough schedule? Mm. The Saints and the Falcons wow. have the easiest schedules in the leagues. And you touched on a little bit earlier yeah. about the NFC South. Mm-hmm. Who do you think has the best chance to win that division? Because 
Nobody really jumps out to me as being a clear runaway because there's so many different issues that all these teams have here, whether it's at the wide receiver position, you know, for Carolina or Atlanta, New Orleans with their QB situation, not sure what's going to happen. You know, earlier I said some people feel like Atlanta could be a dark horse to come out of the NFC knowing that they're in the South. And in regards to your question, I'll side with Tampa because I've seen them do it before with this group of guys under this coaching staff. Baker Mayfield revitalized his career last year in Tampa. You brought back Mike Evans, which is huge. You still got Chris Godwin. Um, you was able to retain guys like Levante David. You just gave an extension to Antoine Winfield Jr. So some of your key components are still there in place from the success you, have, you had a year ago. In regards to Atlanta, we just haven't seen it. We haven't seen them do it before. I love the additions they've made, adding Kirk Cousins, number one. Uh, Raheem Morris was a great hire as well. Players coach. They added some talent via free agency and then, of course, through the draft. But we haven't seen them put it together yet. Not saying that I don't expect them to, but you guys know how it is in sports. Sometimes the unknown could be scary. What do we know about Tampa? We've seen this group do it. And this, the, the thing I love about Tampa, Chris, they play some of their best football in playoff time. When you look at what they did in round one, and even playing against Detroit in round two, they took Detroit down to the wire, got off to a slow start, but they were battle-tested. They fought. Yes, they lost, but... The way they fought made me feel very, very optimistic about what they could do moving forward. So outside with Tampa right now in regards to the NFC South, solely because we've seen these group of guys under, under this staff do it before. Yeah, uh, really great season for the Buccaneers. Nobody saw it coming. Baker Mayfield yep. coming over, of course, big, as you said, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin. Uh, Mike Evans, it doesn't matter. Who's that quarterback for Mike Evans? Throw it to Mike. He's, he's going to, to Mike. get it. He's going to get it. He's going to pick yards. up his 1,000 yards yes. every Future single season. No doubt about that. Any questions you have, uh-uh, it's not happening. But around the corner, y'all, we're going to take a more narrowed focus with the schedule release because it's time to analyze yes. and evaluate some of the AFC teams and what their schedules might mean for their success. That's coming up next. Reunions, revenge games, rematches, oh my. The 2024 schedule was officially revealed Wednesday night with storylines aplenty, including a rematch in week seven of Super Bowl 58 between the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs, with Kansas City earning their fourth Super Bowl title in franchise history in a 28 to 25 overtime victory over San Francisco and the third title in the Mahomes era. Kansas City looking to make it three straight and cement themselves into some rare air. And it all begins for the defense champs with the first game of the season opening night at Arrowhead Stadium in the AFC title game rematch hosting the Baltimore Ravens. They follow up with the fifth installment of another chapter of the epic rivalry between Joe Burrow and Mahomes as the Chiefs host the Bengals and speaking of epic rivalries the Chiefs and Bills will face off for their fifth straight year in the regular season with the Bills winning three of the previous four matchups. This one taking place in week 11. A lot of action going on for Kansas City as they eye their quest for their third straight title. We now bring back CBS Sports NFL analyst and two-time Super Bowl champ Brian McFadden as we dive into the reigning champ's path to a repeat title. And when you look at the Chiefs' schedule, there's a couple of tough games to open the year. There's a bye before their meeting with San Francisco. Vegas has them set at 11 and a half wins on the season with matchups against Baltimore, Buffalo, Houston, and San Francisco. I'm going to throw in Pittsburgh for you in that no one question. as well. But Christmas. does this look like a 12-plus win season for Kansas City? Uh, you know, barring... Good health, yes. And the reason why I say that is because under Andy Reid, you know, that has kind of been the standard for him, you know, coaching in Kansas City with Pat Mahomes as his quarterback, you know, at least 12 ball games. You know, it has kind of been the standard, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. Even though they're the reigning Super Bowl champs, they will be getting every opposing team's best effort. Yeah. It doesn't matter. They're going to squash them, <laughs> just as you see there on your graphic, like they've done year after year. So I factored that into the equation, and I love how they start this season because, yes, they're playing against Baltimore. They're playing against Cincinnati, two, you know, playoff caliber teams. But, Keanu, they get them at home. And then they get Baltimore the very first game of the season. Recent history tell, has, has shown all of us in those matchups, the defending champs, they're 13-5. and five. 
So they have won, the, the champions have won that game more so than losing that ball game, even with Kansas City losing last year, but they didn't have two key components in regards to Travis Kelsey and Chris Jones. And then after that, you get Cincinnati with extra rest because you play Thursday night. So you get extra rest to play against Cincinnati and you get Cincinnati right there in the crib at the crib again. So you're talking about playing those two ball game, those two ball clubs back to back. I would rather have them in the scenario they currently have them in because you get extra rest and you get them in your backyard. Yeah, and you talk about that game last year against the Lions, even though they were without two of their best players, talking about Travis Kelsey and Chris Jones on the yeah. defensive side of the ball. Still a very close game, narrow loss in that one. But I want to stick with the AFC West. Now, outside of the Chiefs, perhaps there's a lot of question marks surrounding the other three teams, including a now Jim Harbaugh-led Chargers team who looks to kind of change that outlook on the bolts. Hopefully there's no more... Charging, as they call it, right? But they have the fifth easiest strength of schedule. The Chargers won five games last year. They lost a lot of talent on offense, and my eyes zero in on Keenan Allen. Vegas has them at eight and a half wins. So my question to you, BMAC, how much of an impact do you think Harbaugh will have on the Chargers' immediate success this season? I mean, if you go back to his time in San Francisco, he didn't make the fans wait. They saw a nice return on their investment. Yeah. You know, clearly when he became the head coach in San Francisco, that led to Super Bowl opportunities. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's the case for, for the Chargers because there's a lot of rebuilding that needs to happen. But I think he's establishing his mindset within this ball club. We're going to set the game within the trenches on either side of the football field, right? We got a quarterback in place. Yes, we lost some key contributors when it comes to the pass catching position, but we got guys that we believe we can lean on and we're going to run the football. Now, when you look at their schedule, if we can get it back on the graphic again, by the time they play against Kansas City, I think that Kansas City game is the fifth game on their schedule, right? The fourth game. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a great indication on who the Chargers, who the Chargers will be. Yeah. They got the Raiders. That's a winnable ball game. Yeah. You got Carolina. That's a winnable ball game. I agree. When okay. it comes to Pittsburgh, three. you know, it's not as winnable as the first two. Okay. But who knows? But you have to travel to Pittsburgh. So if you take care of your business to a degree, or if you go out in that three-game stretch, you're two and one, you play Kansas City in a great spot, and then you have the bye right after that. And then after that, you got Denver, Arizona, Saints. Yeah. Three winnable ball games after your bye game. So this is a great way. If I'm the Chargers, this is how I want to start the season off, Kiana. Playing against two teams, two teams that we feel we can win. We can beat those ball games. And the one luxury they have on their side, when you factor in the first two ball games, heck, even the third ball game, they have a better quarterback than those three opponents. Yeah. No, that's based bad. on what we've seen. Right? Yeah. So that's a key component as well. Yeah, and like you said, uh, Harbaugh came into San Francisco. It wasn't more so wait. It was let's get to the wins now. Certainly a positive thing for the Chargers. They look to turn their narrative around. But we also didn't talk about Week 12. That's a brother against brother matchup from <laughs> one Harbaugh to another. John Harbaugh and co opening up the season against the defending champs. Now week three through six games, those are games against Dallas, against Buffalo, against Cincinnati. They've got a Christmas Day game against C.J. Stroud and the Texans. If you recall, Baltimore had the best record in the league last year, just four losses on the season. But BVAC, they lost a lot of talent on the defensive side of the ball this offseason. Do you think that they can maybe replicate that success this year, or do you think they'll have maybe a taller hill to climb? Well, I think they can repeat some of the success because you still got Lamar Jackson. You added Derrick Henry. This is an unbelievable running team without Derrick Henry. You bring Derrick Henry into the fold, look out. Now, what will this defense look like without Mike McDonald, who became the head coach for the Seattle Seahawks? Mm -hmm. If you go back to a year ago, they did two things extremely well, sacking the quarterbacks and creating turnovers. Can they keep that same mindset defensively because their team really benefited from those elements from the defensive side. So those are my concerns with their team. But when you have Lamar Jackson, you have more than a fighting chance. Now, could we put their schedule back up on the graphic real quick? Because they have a very, very tricky schedule when you look at the first game and then what follows after the first game against Kansas City. You got Kansas City and then you get the Raiders, right? But then you get Dallas, you get Buffalo, you get Cincy. That's a very, very difficult three-game stretch. And you travel in two of those three games to Dallas and to Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. So when you factor in how they start the season off and before they get to that Washington Commander game, which is week six, those are three very, very important ball games because you're playing against two 
AFC foes, and one is in your division in the Cincinnati Bengals. So by the time we get to week six, we got a great indicator on what type of team this Raven team is and will be moving forward. I feel like we can learn a lot about these teams just the first few weeks of the Fast. season, but we cannot talk about the AFC without talking about your boys. Here we go, Steelers. The Steelers, what? They gutted their quarterback room. Yes, had a Pro Bowl linebacker patch of Queen. Had an underrated offseason, and you know what? I'm not even going to really set you up for this one. I just want you to just give me your impressions. What do you like? What don't you like? Concerns? Prime time? Lay it on us. What do well, you like? We, we know that the Steelers have one of the tougher schedules. Heck, just in the division alone right I love how they start the season now that Atlanta game is kind of tricky we don't know mm -hmm. Kirk Cousins Raheem Morris nice talent there we don't know what to expect right but if you take care of business against Atlanta you gotta like your chances against Denver you gotta like your chances against the Chargers you gotta like your chances against the Colts yeah right two te three teams are trying to figure things out all with you know, now Justin Herbert's not a young quarterback, but Denver, young quarterback, and potentially Bo Nix. And, of course, Richardson returns to the Colts. And then you got Dallas, you got the Raiders. So I love how they start the schedule off. I'm more concerned about week one than I am about week two, week three, and week four because that is a team that could be a very tricky team in the Atlanta Falcons. And I know one thing about the schedule when I played we always want to start off 1-0. and Yeah. We want to get that first victory out of the way right now. You don't want to wait. And as fans, you don't want to wait either. You know, you're a 49er fan. Think about the years when you guys used to start off 0-1. Oh, yeah, that was It's like, feeling. now, when are we going to get our first victory? <laughs> right? So for players, week one is super important because you don't want to start off 0-1. Now you've put all of your attention in week two because you don't want to start off what? 0-2. Right, and that is the slump or the conundrum that some people, some teams get involved in, and the same can be said for fan bases. So for Pittsburgh, week one is a very, very tricky game because yeah. if they can take care of their business week one, I love the next three ball games being in their favor based on the opponents they will be seeing. All right, let's wrap up our AFC chat with one of the teams with the biggest expectations last year, but I feel like it may have been one of the biggest letdowns. The Jets, they won seven games last year without Aaron Rodgers. Nine and a half wins set for them, beginning with the Niners, Titans, Patriots, Broncos, and Vikings. Do you think that's achievable this time around? Looking at how their schedule flows, perhaps, I mean, looking at this schedule, maybe could they start five and one, throwing it out there? Under the assumption of a few things, Number one, health, being healthy, Aaron Rodgers. Don't lose any offensive linemen. That's mm -hmm. one thing about the, the, the Jets. They, injuries happen every year to key components on the offensive line, and their defense still staying afloat. But look at their schedule, guys. Yes, you got to go out to San Francisco. I think they're six and a half point underdog right now. Mm -hmm. But then you got Tennessee, you got the Patriots, you got the Broncos, you got the Vikings abroad in London, and then you get the Bills Monday night. That stretch between week two and week five are winnable ball games with Aaron Rodgers. Winnable ball games. If you're a Jets fan, of course, you got to travel out to San Francisco, your 49ers, championship caliber team. But outside of that, week two and week five are all winnable ball games. So if you're telling me by the time you get to the Bills in week six, if you're a Jets fan and you're five and one, getting ready to play against a divisional foe in the Buffalo Bills. You're taking that and you're running with it because that's a great way to start the season off. I feel like 5-1 and one is achievable looking at that schedule yeah. that we just saw. So maybe possibly good things coming for Jets fans. BMAC, if somebody knows the AFC, it's this guy right here. Appreciate the insight. Thanks so much. So let's take a look at the odds to win the AFC. Defending champs, obviously, with the shortest odds to win the conference. They're followed by Lamar Jackson and the Ravens at plus 490. Joe Burrow and the Bengals, who actually missed the postseason last year with the third shortest odds at plus 700, along with the Bills. And this Texans team, who can be very, very scary, BMAC, I think there's a, they're the team to look out for. Thanks. Should all their pieces come together the way they anticipate, rounding out the top five best odds at plus 850 to win the AFC. Lions, Giants, Bears, oh my. We head to the NFC to break down the upcoming 2024 schedule and our two-time Super Bowl champ returns to tell us how much of an impact Caleb Williams could really have on the Bears' win total. That's coming your way next on CBS Sports HQ. Have the monsters of the Midway finally found their man? Well, Bears fans sure hope so with a decades-long parade of quarterbacks and no Super Bowl title since Jim McMahon in 1985. Caleb Williams has been anointed as Chicago's best chance to return to greatness for a franchise star of postseason relevancy. 
Well, Williams, welcome to the NFL moment comes at home at Soldier Field hosting the Titans, but we too circled that on your calendar. Two first round quarterbacks going head to head as Williams hits the road for the first time to take on CJ Stroud and the Texans in prime time for Sunday night football. Maybe week 11 through 16, a gauntlet of divisional matches sandwiched between a meeting with the 49ers. Something interesting to look at is Caleb Williams make his NFL debut. Back here with the two time Super Bowl champ Brian McFadden and looking at the schedule for the Chicago Bears. Are there any concerns looking at their schedule and also just how rookie friendly do you think this might be <laughs> for Caleb Williams making his introduction to the NFL? I think the concerns for me, it happens in the second half of the season when you talk about playing against the Vikings, the Lions, the 49ers, the Vikings, and the Lions in Seattle, in Green Bay. <laughs> I mean, you look at how they finished the season from week 11 to week 18. Good luck because you're playing against divisional foes and playoff caliber teams. But by that time, you kind of know exactly who your quarterback is in Caleb Williams. You know, you got a great understanding in who your team is in totality. So you got to be ready to rock and roll. But as I stated earlier, stated earlier, Week one is a great game for Chicago because that's a winnable game. I love the additions the Tennessee Titans have made around Will Levis, Calvin Ridley, bringing D-Hop back, you know, Tony Pollard. Uh, they made some additions on the defensive side. But if you're Chicago, you got to like your opportunity in that ball game because Tennessee was a inconsistent team a year ago, and they still have a young quarterback as well. And for your rookie quarterback, Kiana, his first game is at home. So he has the great home environment at his disposable at his disposal instead of trying to get a win on the road being your first game in that type of environment. So for Chicago, this is a great place to be in. It's very, very unique when you look at how the schedule was orchestrated. But by the time you get into that gauntlet between week 11 and week 17, you kind of know who you are as a ball club. Yeah, absolutely. And I think about how Chicago finished that season last year. Mm -hmm. They were kind of on a roll and, and, and could have, I mean, it was a little bit of a long shot, but had an opportunity to make the postseason, hopefully trying to keep that going. But I want to move on to uh, America's team. Are they really America's team? Yeah, so they say. Okay. All right. We're going to move <laughs> on to that. It's been 29 years since they last won an NFC championship game. Looking to get that monkey off their back. This year, Dak's final year under contract three road trips in their first five games on paper the end of the season looks a little lighter for the Cowboys no but question. looking at this schedule does anything jump out to you about America's quote-unquote team you know what for the very first time we don't see week one against the Giants huh, for the Cowboys, right but they got to go to Cleveland a very very intriguing team outside of that you have the Saints the Ravens and you get the Giants Thursday night followed by the Steelers on Sunday night so this is a unique situation for Dallas because the concerns had it, it, it hasn't been regular season production. The season for the Dallas Cowboys don't start until postseason play. Mm -hmm. yep. We believe they have what it takes to get into that postseason type of environment, but a lot can transpire between now and playoff football. But for the Dallas Cowboys, I love this week one matchup because they travel to Cleveland playing against one of the defenses that were one of the best in the National Football, uh, football League last year, and your quarterback gets an opportunity to really show, I still got it. You know what I mean? Because this is a prove me year for Dak mm -hmm. Prescott. This is a prove me year for Coach McCarthy as well because it's safe to say those two guys are tied to the hip if things does not work out in regards to the win-loss record. But you're playing against a team in the Cleveland Browns with Deshaun Watson. I think their team could be one of the talented, most talented teams in the AFC when you look at the, what the Cleveland Browns have. So that's a very, very intriguing game for Dallas week one compared to what we've seen in years past when they played against the New York Giants yep. in, 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 in a divisional foe. Even though it was a divisional foe, the Dallas was clearly by far the more talented team on the football field when they faced off against the Giants week one. This is a different animal this year at week one playing against the Cleveland Browns. A lot on the line for Dallas, as BMAC mentioned. All right, I'm not sure if there was a bigger letdown in the NFC than the Eagles, who were the team to beat until like about week 13, and then everything went downhill from there. But... They're opening up the season in Brazil against the Packers early week five by ten and a half wins. Same as the Cowboys. Mm. Is this schedule built for Philly to get back to the top of the NFC East? Yeah, no question, Keanu, because 
I think Justin, not Justin, Jalen Hurts will have a bounce back year compared to similar to what he did his Super Bowl run with the Eagles when they made it to the Super Bowl. They added Saquon Barkley, one mm -hmm. of the more talented running backs in the National Football League. They've added some studs on the defensive side. I love what they did in the draft. You know, Quayon Mitchell, uh, Cooper DeJean. So this is a team, personnel-wise, I like what they've done. They got to be more stout at the point of attack, especially on the defensive side. You know, they paid their two wide receivers and uh, AJ and Smitty. So, yeah, I, I, I love the Eagles being able to showcase their ability to get back to the top of the NFC East. Week one is Green Bay. Will they be loved? Will they be loved by Jordan Love? <laughs> if you're a Philadelphia Eagle fan, you don't want any love from Jordan Love. No. You want to dish out heartache and pain because if he's showing love, that means he's doing some pretty good things against your defense. So this is a great test for the Eagles defensively week one, playing against Jordan Love and those outstanding pass catchers that he has at the disposal of throwing the football to along with the running game with now uh, Jacobs being a part of their team offensively. So, Eagles, Philly, you're going to get a chance to see exactly what your defense is made of, especially in the secondary, because that was kind of the Achilles heel of their defense a year ago and having inconsistent performances against opposing offenses, passing attack out the gate, cross seas in Brazil, Friday night football, Varsity will be playing. It ain't the JV, it's the varsity <laughs> when the Eagles face off against Green Bay. And let's see exactly what... Philly's defense can do in the secondary against Joy and Love. Yeah, you talked about that new face in a new place. Well, I want to stick with the NFC East and zero in on the Giants. They open their season at home. They have three primetime games, a trip to Germany on the schedule, another Thanksgiving matchup on the road, and they'll have their first look at that guy you talked about. Saquon Barkley in a different uniform. That's week seven at home. They had six wins last year. Do we think they can surpass that this time around with what lies ahead? I'll tell you this much, Kiana. If you ask me this question after week two, I, I promise you I have an answer for you. Mm. A confirmed answer. I don't know. But the reason why I feel like after week two, I'll know exactly what this team could do. Because look at the teams. Minnesota, Washington. Two teams that will have new quarterbacks. One team for sure will have a rookie quarterback, quote unquote, starting as we see it today. The other team have potentially a rookie or a journeyman in Sam Donald as the starting quarterback. Yeah. So if you're the New York Giants under Brian Dayball, who I believe is a real good coach in the National Football League, if your quarterback is healthy, you got to win these ball games. Yeah. You cannot start the season off 0-2 for sure. I mean, if you start off 1-1, one one, I think it's safe to say the Giants fan base, they had the lighter fluid ready, but it ain't <laughs> lit. It ain't lit. But if you start off 0-2 against Washington and Minnesota, they're lighting that house on fire. Deserving so because you got to find a way to win a ball game. You have the more, the more experienced quarterback in regards to starts yeah. as of late on your team playing against offenses that are trying to figure things out with new quarterbacks. That's very, very important. And one team has an entire new regime when it comes to coaching in the Washington Commanders, along with a potential rookie starting at quarterback for them. So that is an opportunity for the New York Giants and their fan base. Listen, they got the lot of fluid ready with the lighter, but they ain't lit it just yet. <laughs> If you start off on 2 light the house on fire, get ready because it's time to burn it all down. Things can get ugly. Uh, Giants fans, uh, cover your eyes. Keep the lighter fluid, the lighters. Keep it all away at least until week <laughs> 2 or 3 is what BMAC's saying. All right. I want to wrap up this discussion. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I want to talk about my boys in the Bay Area. 11 and a half wins Vegas has them at. They had the best record of the NFC last year. BMAC, this is how we're going to do this one. Where's I want got? you to tell me why I should feel real good about this schedule and then also tell me why I should be a little bit concerned. Well, you should feel good about this schedule because I think it's safe to say at least 90% of the teams you're going to play against, Kiana, you have more talent. Okay. Okay. That's the first thing. All right. Secondly, I feel why good about you should that. be a little concerned about this schedule. Is there any Super Bowl hangover? Oh. I, I don't drink, so I don't know how it feels to be hungover. <laughs> but I, I can know tell a you lot it's not good. People Exactly. <laughs> have endured bad hangovers. And when you're hungover, I don't know personally, but I've seen, and Kiana just informed all of us, she's been hungover before. You don't feel good. No. You don't feel good because what happens when you're hungover, you think about what led to you being hungover. Why did I do that? Will they have any Super Bowl-like hangover moments in regards to, dang, we, let, we allow one to slip through our fingers. 
and not focus on the here and now because the teams that are going to face off against can care less about what they did not do yep. in Las Vegas. It's about finding a way to beat a team that made it to a place that we would like to go, which is the Super Bowl. So those are my areas of concern for your San Francisco. But like I said, to start off, the benefit that you have is this is one of the more talented teams in the National Football League as we see it today based on their personnel. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of coming off that first Super Bowl loss against the Chiefs back in that 2019-2020 season, mm -hmm. came out of the gate, and you talk about that Super Bowl hangover. It wasn't pretty for that team opening yeah. up that season. So hopefully looking to turn things around out there in the Bay Area. Uh, BMAC, sounding like my mom. Why do you keep drinking yes, if it makes you feel you like that? that? You know, I, used, I, was, I was so dumb. Why did I do that? <laughs> All right, I, and you know, that's why I stick with the light stuff now. All right. Taking a look at the odds to win the NFC, my defending NFC champs with the shortest odds at plus 250. They're followed by the Lions, who won their first playoff game in 32 years. They have the second best odds in the conference at plus 600. Vegas not riding off the Eagles following that massive collapse last season. Also, BMAC spoke highly of them. They're plus 650 to take the NFC along with the Cowboys. And Jordan Love and the Packers round out the top five shortest odds at plus 850. We dive more into what lies ahead in the NFL for the 2024 season. We examine the top revenge games to watch for. That's coming up next on CBS Sports HQ.